Our first speaker is Peter Choiki. He got his MD from Jefferson Medical College. He did a residency at Yale New Haven Hospital. He then did a fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania, joined the faculty at Georgetown, and then he came to NCI. So he started the Molecular Imaging Program. He's the director of the imaging section and a senior investigator. And his title, Imaging of Cancer, Pete. Thank you, Terry, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is a talk about the various tools that we use in imaging to image cancer. It's a, it's a light physics engineering uh, talk and uh, very little on biology. Um, imaging, of course, is extremely important in cancer. We use it for screening, for instance, for lung cancer or breast cancer, staging, um, and monitoring of treatment. And then after treatment for recurrent disease and establishing prognosis for the patient. So the main uh, imaging devices that we use are the computed tomography or CT, magnetic resonance imaging, ultrasound, single photon emission computed tomography, positron emission tomography, and optical imaging. And we'll talk about each of these in turn, describing both their uh, strengths and a little bit of their limitations. So one of the things you'll notice as you walk around a radiology department is that with the exception of ultrasound, which is the odd man out, these machines all look uh, superficially about the same. They have a, a gantry and uh, a, this sort of donut that um, where the imaging takes place. And it's the reason why this imaging all looks about the same is that it's all tomographic, meaning it cuts the body in planes and uh, the geometry is such that the circle is the best way to accomplish that. And we'll, talk, we'll show why that's true in a second. So let's begin with the workhorse computed tomography. So this is a CT of uh, a person who has a lung cancer that's, as you can see, sort of spreading into the parenchyma of the lung. So how is this image obtained? Well, basic to all imaging using x-ray is the production of x-rays. And in order to do that, you have a very high voltage coil that releases electrons at very high energy, typically in the 50 to 150 kilovolt range. And these electrons strike uh, the anode, or, which is usually a tungsten target, and the result of that interaction are x-rays that, uh, that are promulgated in multiple directions. But of course, we don't really want all of the x-rays that are produced, so we collimate this beam using some kind of heavy metal, uh, could be tungsten itself or it could be lead, to direct the x-rays in a specific way. But this is the very basics of an x-ray tube. In fact, uh, it, this is really not very different conceptually from what Wilhelm Röntgen did in 1898 uh, when he first observed uh, his wife's hand on an on a x-ray film after exposure from uh, an, a primitive cathode ray tube. But we've modernized things quite a bit, so our x-ray tube now goes around in a circle, creating a fan beam that goes through the patient and the patient lies on this gantry and then travels in and out on the table. So as you cut away a modern CT device, you'll see this x-ray device, which swings around the patient at, um, at several times per second. So it's an incredibly fast uh, procedure and there are actually very uh, high forces, torques that are generated. So the the actual um, engineering behind this came from turbine jet engines uh, because this is the kind of velocities that are reached um, <clears throat> uh, there. And then there's a s series of detectors. Usually now, although this one's depicted just uh, opposite the x-ray tube, now 
they are really all the way around the patient. And uh, these are what detect the residual x-ray that comes through uh, the patient. So how do we form an image? Well, I think it's pretty intuitive. If you have an x-ray source and this very simple four tube patient, and you start applying x-rays in this direction, you'll see an output like this. If you move <clears throat> a little bit, you'll see an output like this, output like this in this direction and so forth. And if you then back project each of these, uh, you'll start to form a crude reconstruction of what this sample looks like. And of course, this is a very crude example with not too many uh, different x-ray positions. But if you imagine 360 or 520 or even more such positions, you could get very refined, uh, detailed images, uh, which you can then form into either slices and or stack those slices to form a a volume or a 3D volume. And so the modern CT scanner creates these inherently 3D volumes of data. And this is an example of what I mean by 3D volume. From the same set of images, we can reconstruct the image coronally or sagittally, um, and each one has a particular value to it. So. Uh, for instance, the kidneys are particularly well depicted in this coronal plane. The spine is very well depicted in the sagittal plane. Another trick that you can do with uh, this image, the same image set, is you can window the CT. This is a digital image, and as a result, you can change the grayscales such that it highlights either some structures, like in this case, the heart, or in this case, the lungs, where you can now bring out all the uh, intricate vessels uh, throughout the, the chest. Typically, we use a, the Hounsfield units, which is a minus 1,000 to plus 1,000 scale, and zero being pure water. So if you were just going to do a water phantom, your CT scanner should read out zero for that. But bone is plus 1,000. Uh, very, you know, low density air is minus 1,000, and then there are a series of tissues in between there that constitute a, uh, uh, the uh, CT image. And because of the assignment of these grayscales, depending on how you do it, you can either get an image like this or an image like that. Now, <clears throat> CT is really the workhorse of modern radiology departments. It's widely available, relatively inexpensive for an imaging device. It requires very minimal preparation on the part of the patient, meaning nothing uh, by mouth beforehand and only uh, drinking oral contrast media, although that's even no longer an, an absolute. And then it's a very rapid scan um, from the neck to the pelvis on our machines here at the clinical center. It's about two to three seconds of scanning. Um, and in fact, the table moves so rapidly that they've had to put uh, brakes on the table so that the patient doesn't shoot off, uh, you know, the, the table because of the acceleration. Uh, it's very high resolution. It's relatively inexpensive. But there are some drawbacks to CT, and the, the number one is radiation. Among the sources of radiation today, CT is probably the most contributory. Uh, because it's so ubiquitous and because the doses are relatively high, uh, it's a very common source of radiation exposure in the general population. And so a lot of work has gone on recently to try to reduce the radiation dose. Additionally, CT requires the use of an iodinated contrast media, and they can occasionally cause allergic reactions and in patients with existing kidney damage can exacerbate that kidney damage. And a third disadvantage is ultimately the only thing CT provides is anatomic information. Now, <clears throat> that's a lot of information, but it can't tell you or characterize the disease very well. So radiation reduction in CT is extremely important, and it's been really led by concerns about exposure of young people to x-rays when 
they are much more sensitive to the effects of ionizing radiation. And manufacturers have been induced to lower the energy of the X-ray beams, which in fact lowers the radiation exposure, develop more sensitive X-ray detectors, uh, more uh, better reconstruction algorithms, and even images that are synthetic. That is, instead of obtaining multiple passes through the patient, you can reconstruct what those other images might look like uh, using um, <clears throat> uh, reconstruction algorithms. Uh, one of the techniques is to change the amount of radiation as a function of where the X-ray beam is in the body. So you can see in this uh, sideways view of the patient that the amount of uh, tissue that the X-ray has to go through in the lung is considerably less than in the abdomen. So you can actually reduce the X-ray exposure as the X-ray goes through the chest portion of the exam and then increase it um, accordingly as you get into the abdomen and pelvis. And the net result is a lower radiation dose to the patient. <clears throat> now, iodinated contrast media is a very, very important fundamental of CT. If we didn't have iodinated contrast media, scans would look like this. They're useful, but they're not that useful. For instance, there's some kind of mass coming out of the kidney that you would recognize without contrast, but after you've given intravenous contrast, you can see that this is a simple renal cyst and of no uh, consequence. But without that, there would be a lot of uncertainty, and you might even try to biopsy that lesion to find out. So it really helps. So these are some basic structures. Um, usually uh, uh, around a benzene ring, there are multiple iodines, and uh, there can be monomers or dimers. And there are two basic classes of these agents, the ionic, which were the early agents that we used, and non-ionic. Uh, this is what we use now. And these are more or less a miracle uh, for someone like me who's transitioned from ion ionic to non-ionic. Because in the old days, we would have problems, very severe reactions to ionic media once or twice per week in a radiology department. And now it's once or twice per year because of the uh, reformulation of this iodinated contrast media. Now, it's quite a large dose of iodine. Uh, we administer for a typical CT somewhere between 30 and 45 grams of iodine for uh, each patient. Now, in patients with normal renal function, the vast majority of that is excreted, but certainly um, it can, this amount of iodine can put off uh, sensitive tests of, for iodine or thyroid function, which depends on iodine. So it's something that has to be kept in mind. To administer the iodinated contrast, we use a, in, an intravenous pump that uh, stands next to the scanner. And I'll show you a little bit of the details. It's, um, there are two channels to the pump. One has the contrast and the other has a flush in two zipper syringes. So having described CT, let's move on to another cross-sectional technique called MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. So this is an example of a prostate MRI with a tumor here in the anterior part of the gland, which is validated by this radical prostatectomy specimen showing a tumor in the same place. MRI has this incredible contrast resolution that enables us to resolve the tumor from the normal prostate structure. How does this work? Well, we're not going to go into deeply into MR physics in the span of this talk. But suffice it to say that w this technique depends on hydrogen protons, um, which are typically, as we sit here in the Earth's magnetic field, uh, going in random directions. There's no order to these spins. You can think of them as little tiny magnets and they're not influenced by the minute magnetic field that we have, we're being exposed to right now from the Earth. But if you put them in a strong magnetic field, you can get them to align with the magnetic field, either in the same direction or the opposite direction. And it's a slightly ener lower energy state to align with the external field, 
So you get a slight preponderance of spins aligned with the magnetic field as opposed to against the magnetic field. And that is the entire basis for MRI. What we do is we apply radio frequency energy to those spins that are aligned, and we can look at them in this way. So here's our spin. It's facing upward, but you can view it as a vector that's actually precessing around the magnetic field. It's precessing at a fixed frequency, and if you interrogate it with RF energy at the same frequency, you can get it to do things. For instance, you can get it to deviate away from this z-axis and go all the way to the x-axis or even in the opposite direction. So you can deviate that with this RF energy. And then as recovery occurs, you can detect the signal with a radio receiver that detects this precessing spin. Here's the spin, for instance, in the horizontal plane, and uh, collects signal. So just to review, you have all these spins either aligned with or against the magnetic field. You apply a radio frequency pulse, deviate the uh, spins into an alternate plane, and as they recover, you start to acquire signal, which you can influence with these other pulse sequences, which we definitely don't have time to discuss. But that's the basics behind it. And you can see there are no x-rays involved. It's actually fairly low energy, so there's no ionizing radiation and yet you can obtain really fantastic images from this really uh, amazing um, uh, anomaly of nature, if you will, or characteristic of nature. Well, how do we create the MR imaging? It's uh, similar to the CT in that we use a kind of back projection technique, but instead of using x-rays, as I put in this insert image, we're using magnetic gradients to decide where uh, the signal is coming from. Uh, and by accumulating a lot of gradients at different strengths, you can figure out where um, the various signals come from using antenna, RF antenna, very similar to a radio antenna. Now, as we look at the engineering behind an MRI scanner, it's, it's an extremely complex device. And in the center of it lies the patient. And then around that, are these gradient coils and radio frequency coils that will apply energy. But very key to this is this um, layer, which is where there are, uh, uh, w w the wire is wound around a core to create a superconducting magnet. So this is all immersed in liquid helium and vacuum packed so that no heat can get into it. And once you charge the magnet up, it can go on for many years so long as you provide it with superconducting uh, level temperatures such as liquid helium. Uh, so th there's actually a huge amount of energy contained within uh, an MRI because the energy is put in and then it's trapped in this, these electrons which are in a never-ending circle around uh, the patient. Uh, creating this very strong magnetic field. Now, the, the, at the top of the magnet, you'll see a vent called the cold head. And in the event that there's a problem, uh, maybe a short circuit in the wire or some kind of uh, heating event, this liquid helium will rapidly turn from liquid to gas, and it has to be vented very quickly out of the uh, room Otherwise, the room will fill up with helium gas and will displace, actually, the air in the room. So it's a very critical safety feature to have this vent on the outside. So MR has a number of really good advantages. It, no radiation, inherently multiplanar, and there are all kinds of little tricks you can play with the pulse sequences, so you can get something called T1 weighting or T2 weighting, diffusion weighting, contrast enhancement, and spectroscopy. And this is just really the, the big ones that you can get out of MRI. So there's a, it's, it's a way of really obtaining a lot of information from tissue. It is much slower than CT. It takes a lot longer. Remember we said two to three seconds for a scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis. That's really on the order of 
30 to 40 minutes on an MRI. It's also a more expensive device. It doesn't show you calcifications. And there are some critical safety issues that have to be burned into the uh, ethos of uh, people working around MRI because otherwise metallic objects can become lethal projectiles. And incompatible implanted devices such as pacemakers or cochlear implants can malfunction if the patient is inadvertently placed in a magnet. So this is the way an MRI looks. It's got the gantry. This is where the superconducting coil is, where the magnet is. And the magnet is always on. Whether the lights are on in the room or not, the magnet is always at full strength. So if you don't see anybody around, the lights are out, you say, oh, it's safe to go in because the magnet is off. Wrong. The magnet is always on, and it's dangerous. And you can see this quench pipe in the roof uh, here, which is uh, exiting outside the building to get uh, helium gas out uh, should it heat up. We have an injector, very much like uh, with CT. And there's a lot of emphasis on hearing protection because these machines are very, very loud. So commonly, we'll put an earplug in the patient. And then on top of that, these noise-canceling headphones um, through which you can also hear music and other things to distract you. But the major purpose is to protect the ears from very high um, decibel. Um, so we work a lot on safety uh, in MRI, and it's very much ingrained into people who work around um, MRIs. Uh, so all these objects can become lethal uh, in and around an active MRI. Um, the MRI literally will grab it out of your hands and, and project it into the magnet. And you can imagine scissors, for instance, flying at 60 miles an hour into a gantry. If there's a patient there, that can be a very serious problem. So in order to avoid that, the design of MR departments is such that in order to get to the scanner, you need to go through a variety of uh, safety zones. So the first zone make sure that it does kind of screening for patients to make sure they're appropriate. Also make sure that no objects like a non-MR uh, compatible gas tank would even enter the area because that could eventually work its way into the scanner if it's not, if we're not careful. So a very critical zone one is where people are inspected as they enter. Uh, this might be a reception area. And then they go into a changing area where uh, they're quizzed about the presence of internal implants. And only then will they be allowed to go into the control room and ultimately into zone four, which is where the MRI scanner is. So in the early days of MR, there were some nasty uh, accidents. Um, fortunately, most of them didn't involve uh, patients, but they uh, were extremely expensive to repair. So this is a floor buffer that's uh, made its way in, surprising very much the night crew that was trying to clean the floor. And here's a cart. And you can see um, they had anticipated that the cart might be a problem, and they had wrapped all kinds of ropes to hold the cart from uh, being sucked into the magnet. But um, the ropes were not strong enough. So uh, bad result. And uh, here is a an air tank that uh, is sort of like a torpedo that um, flew into the magnet. Uh, in this case, again, no one was hurt, but it uh, could have been a disaster. So you got to really take these warnings um, seriously. So let's go to happier subjects about what MRI can do. Uh, so MRI also has a contrast agent, uh, and it is also extremely useful. It's based on gadolinium instead of iodine. And here are some molecules that are, are uh, contrast agents for MRI. And gadolinium is a metal, so it needs to be chelated. And there are different kinds of chelates. Some are stronger than others that will retain the gadolinium inside this molecule. And that's important because gadolinium ion, the free ion, will get into the bones, the liver, and other organs and cause trouble unless it's chelated, in which case it'll just be excreted out. So <clears throat> you may have 
heard in um, the lay press about problems with gadolinium. And I want to talk about that a little bit because um, it, it is a significant issue, but it's nothing that is, it's something that we've adapted to and uh, have now have ways of managing. So about five or six years ago, this was the current status of the contrast agents that were available. And from a performance point of view, they all looked and worked about the same. So there wasn't really a reason except price to choose one over the other. But there were very big differences in the thermodynamic stability, that is the ability of that chelate to retain the gadolinium. And uh, these are in um, orders of magnitude. So you can see this group is about 16 or is in the 16s, whereas this group is in the 22s to 25s. And that's multiple orders of magnitude stronger. These aren't just linear, these are logarithmic differences. Well, it turned out that gadolinium did in fact come off some of these agents. They're no longer widely used because of that reason. And in patients who had poor renal function, a very sad side effect occurred called nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, where the gadolinium came off the chelate into the soft tissues and created this fibrosis that prevented the patients from bending their leg, for instance, or moving their hands. And um, it was very sad. Fortunately, worldwide, it was pretty much one of the uh, first times that the you know, internet played an amazing role in uh, alarming or alerting physicians to the possibility of this. And I would say within a year, uh, the culpable agents in the high-risk population uh, were eliminated. And we really haven't seen any cases of this since the late 2000s. But it's a, it's a good object lesson in how dangerous the gadolinium can be if it comes off the chelate. So gadolinium is highly con uh, toxic. Patients with normal renal function usually excrete it rapidly and there's nothing to worry about. But patients with severe renal damage may take weeks or even longer to excrete the agent, and eventually the gadolinium comes off and causes a, a profound inflammatory response. Now, what's going on in the uh, news today is something a little bit different, and that is the observation that if you look at um, specific parts of the brain in patients who have received multiple doses of gadolinium, you can actually see residual gadolinium in the brain. <clears throat> and this has been confirmed at autopsies, uh, on imaging studies. It's, it's, a, it's really a very well-known fact now. It, there's no argument about it. But the argument revolves around, is this dangerous or not? Well, certainly, you could argue gadolinium shouldn't be in the brain. So that's bad, per se. <clears throat> but in fact, very large correlative studies trying to identify neurologic uh, symptoms in these patients have been negative. We can't find any sequelae of this. And of course, uh, patients should not get unnecessary MRIs, but so we assume that there is good reason why patients get MRIs. And um, there is always a risk benefit. So there is this uh, issue. Clearly, these agents at the bottom of our thermodynamic stability constant will be preferable because it's it's clear that these agents result in much less deposition than the other agents. So that's where we are right now. There are many uh, uh, meetings being held on the, the uh, significance of residual gadolinium. Uh, there are no firm conclusions and uh, studies are ongoing. So let's go on to ultrasound, which is usually a fun topic because it has a lot to do with obstetrics and uh, ultrasound is a great technique, really one of my favorites, and the basics of it are, are really straightforward. It's sound waves uh, that you can't hear, but sound waves that are sent out from a transducer, reflect off an object, and are received. Now, what we actually see as an ultrasound is related to the speed of the sound as it goes through this tissue, not necessarily just the reflection, because the faster um, uh, 
returning waves will be amplified and slower ones will be uh, decreased and then you can form a grayscale image based on that. So there are all kinds of great uh, effects that you can see from putting ultrasound on a patient. Here's a transducer on skin and uh, the, the, if there's some kind of object in there such as a metal plate that blocks sound, I will also say that air blocks sound. So if this is the lung, you won't get any sound going through uh, where the air interface is. The sound can be absorbed. It can be reflected, as we mentioned. It can be scattered in multiple directions, like little punctate calcifications will scatter the light. So you'll see this kind of amplified um, glow coming from uh, uh, microcalcification. The light can be refracted, or the sound can be refracted just like light, or diffracted just like light. And the technology is uh, deceivingly uh, simple. That is, it looks simple, but it's really very complicated. Inside the ultrasound probe is a piezoelectric crystal that when you apply uh, electrical current to, will uh, produce ultrasound waves through the uh, interface and you can get all kinds of different frequencies and intracavitary probes. Uh, these are commonly used during intraoperative procedures, uh, no radiation, and handheld real-time imaging. So they produce really um, pretty spectacular images. This is a patient with multiple metastases of the liver, and you can see them quite clearly. So we've evolved from these machines that are about as big as a person to machines that can be, are sort of like an iPad and down to a uh, iPhone type uh, sized ultrasound. So many people believe that this kind of device will be a replacement for the stethoscope in the future. You'll just have a handheld uh, grayscale ultrasound device. Uh, oh, combined with a, a, a wireless or Bluetooth type ultrasound probe. So because it's real time, it's, uh, it's a preferred modality for interventional procedures because you can watch the whole procedure in real time without exposing the patient to any kind of radiation. So you place the transducer on the patient. If you want to target this particular item below the surface, you can watch the needle uh, go into the, the lesion under real time. If you're missing it, you can redirect it. So it's, a, it's a really a great method for getting the needle in the right place. So again, no radiation, real time, inexpensive. Globally, this is the imaging method of choice around the world. It's quick, no prep, no injection. The, there are a number of disadvantages to ultrasound. Uh, the prime one being it's very operator dependent. It's not something that you can just pick up and learn. You really need quite a bit of experience to do good ultrasound imaging. And I analogize this to um, if you were in a dark room, such as this room, and it was completely black, and you only had a flashlight, and you shine the flashlight around the room, and then stepped out of the room, and someone said, well, what's in the room? And you would see what you shine the flashlight on, maybe some chairs, maybe the wall, um, had not great detail. But if you didn't shine the flashlight in the back and see the garbage can in the black back, you might not even know that exists. So it's, you only see what you look for, whereas CT or MRI gets kind of the whole picture of the room. Ultrasound's also difficult to quantify, and there are many areas where you can't do ultrasound. For instance, the lungs, remember I said air just completely reflects light, uh, sound, so uh, you, uh, you have that problem, brain covered by bone and uh, other bones. Now there are, is a contrast agent for ultrasound. It's called micro bubbles and uh, they look like this. They're on the order of microns in size and they're filled with a fluorine gas, a perfluorocarbon gas. Um, and they are injected. Because of their size, they tend to stay in vessels. They don't leak out of vessels like gadolinium and iodinated contrast media will leak. And when you insinate them, 
they often will explode um, because of the compressive forces from the sound and it will release these um, little um, uh, pockets of gas. The gas will then get, you just breathe it out um, as the method of excretion. But it can be useful in identifying lesions that might be hard to see without contrast media. Uh, and you can see these uh, hepatic lesions here very nicely and the vessels that are very easy to see because of all these micro bubbles within them. It's a very safe agent, uh, but it's not in widespread use uh, because of the availability of other uh, agents like iodinated contrast for CT and gadolinium for MRI, which are easier or at least more commonly used. So in some developing countries, these are more commonly used than in the United States. So home stretching it, we're gonna talk about some nuclear medicine techniques. Um, the first one is what's known, it's a mouthful, it's single photon emission computed tomography, or SPECT. So it's really uh, two things together, the single photon emission and computed tomography. So computed tomography, you're all familiar with, uh, it's really the same ideas, Nothing really unique there. But let's talk about single photon emission. What is radioactivity? Well, radioactivity is the decay of a nucleus into component parts. So one way a nucleus can decay is by releasing essentially two helium, uh, two protons, two neutrons uh, with a net two plus charge or an alpha particle. So that's like the bowling ball of nuclear particles. It's this big high energy um, uh, particle that's called an alpha particle or alpha ray. They're not used for imaging at all. They are used for therapy to some extent. The next is the beta particle or beta ray, which is a single electron highly charged that's emitted from the nucleus. And the final is a photon or gamma ray uh, that's emitted. So we're talking about this um, the gamma ray, which is the lowest of these three energy sources, but it comes out of the nucleus in any random direction, uh, very unpredictably. So you have single photon emission, and somehow you have to gather that information into an image, and that's the task, and that's called SPECT imaging. So in order to see it, you first need a compound that's radioactive and that goes to a specific part of the body that's of interest. So here's an example, technetium methyl diphosphonate or the bone scan. So that's an agent that has this radioactive single photon emitter, technetium 99M, and it's conjugated to this compound that actually acts like phosphorus. So wherever there's calcium, it'll bind, and uh, that's why it's a good bone agent. And you can see the way that looks in this patient with metastatic disease, where all the areas of bone destruction and regrowth uh, and repair are going to be active and show up as hot spots on the SPECT CT scan. And the bone scan is really a fundamental scan for nuclear medicine. But in order to achieve that, remember I said that these X-rays are coming off or gamma rays are coming off at all different directions. And if you're ever going to hope to understand where they're coming from so you can create an image, you need to collimate them. And so always there's this grid, uh, typically made out of tungsten or another heavy metal, that will reject any um, gamma ray that's off axis, that doesn't go straight down the collimation. So only the straight collimated beam is allowed through the collimator and then it can be detected by these, uh, these detectors. And the reason I'm telling you that, this is the way one of these looks like. It's like a little honeycomb, but you can see there's a depth to it of about a centimeter or so. And those x-rays have to make it all the way down. If they bounce into the wall, they're not gonna make it. Only the ones that go straight through are going to make it. And that means that the majority, the vast majority, 99% of the radioactivity is rejected, never forms the image. Uh, it's absorbed by the patient, yes, but uh, it doesn't form the image. So it's, it's relatively inefficient. Um, 
nonetheless, it's been around for over 50 years, and it's um, been used in a variety of ways. Um, you have the bone scan. There are ways of imaging the thyroid gland. Um, you can look at the parathyroid gland with this agent. Uh, you can label white cells with this agent. You can look at the thyroid gland. This is a I-131 scan of a patient <clears throat> showing a, a thyroid tumor uh, and uh, some metastatic disease. So it, it, is, you, it has utility, but you can see the images are very fuzzy and indistinct, and that's related to the low photon count uh, because you have to screen out the vast majority of the events. So it's it's a relatively inexpensive technique. There's broad experience, as I said, over 50 years. But um, compared to other techniques, there's quite a bit of radiation exposure. Uh, it does require some preparation of an imaging agent. There's a lot of nuclear regulatory limitations, and the scanning is slow. Typically today, we'll have a, a CT scan attached to the SPECT device so that you can obtain um, a crude image on SPECT and then correlate it with CT. This is so-called hybrid imaging because it combines two different modalities together to get sort of the best, best from both uh, worlds. And the images can be quite nice. This is obviously the CT scan and superimposed upon it are two very hot lymph nodes from this uh, imaging method. So I want to move on uh, to uh, positron emission tomography, which is a more uh, elegant method of radionuclide imaging. And this depends on the emission not of an electron from the nucleus, but of a positron, which is a positively charged electron. Now, those of you who took some nuclear physics in in college will accept this. Others of you may look at me very doubtfully. Uh, for those of you who look at me doubtfully, it's also known as antimatter, uh, which sounds even more dubious. So, but what does happen is this positron will encounter an electron. So antimatter meets matter and it annihilates. And in that annihilation is released are two gamma rays with a characteristic energy of 511 keV in opposite directions. And we'll talk about that in a, a little more detail. So just to review, for instance, this F18 nucleus gives off a positron. Not all uh, atoms or isotopes produce positrons. So only a select number uh, of isotopes will produce positrons. And it's probably about 10 uh, or 15, only about five of which are really relevant to medicine. So that, depending on the energy of the positron, it'll flow away from the nucleus. The higher the energy, it'll get further away. But eventually, it'll counter an electron and annihilate and produce these two oppositely uh, directed uh, gamma rays of characteristic energy. And because of that, if you have a ring of detectors around this event, you can detect where the event happened, at least the line of response as it's known, because this detector and this detector will detect an event opposite each other. And because you have that in 360 degrees, you can um, really start to compose an image based on all these different lines of response. So this is uh, better in the sense that it doesn't require collimation. The event itself is collimated. You know the direction from which these, um, the event took, and so that you, you have a lot more a priori knowledge about where it's coming from. So this is a very powerful technique. My program is very focused on PET scanning because it's incredibly sensitive. It has nanomolar to picomolar sensitivity um, and it's already made huge um, advances in the field of cancer. One of the, the most dramatic uh, has been the labeling of deoxyglucose, or FDG, which is the most common pet agent used. 
And this is based on the work of Otto Warburg, who made the observation that cancer cells and some other processes switch to a process called aerobic glycolysis, in which despite the presence of oxygen, will process pyruvate to lactate rather than pyruvate to the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle, much more efficient, throws up many more ATP molecules than does uh, the uh, glycolysis. But nonetheless, uh, it's used by cancers for um, some known and some unknown reasons. And as a result, the transporter for glucose on um, tumor cells is, is amplified. There are a lot of glucose transporters on cancer cells. So when you put in this artificial glucose, it's taken up rapidly by the cancer cell in the expectation that it's uh, sugar. And it begins to be acted upon by the hexokinases. But because it's not really a sugar, it's a deoxyglucose, nothing happens to it. It's not metabolized. And instead, it just accumulates in the cell. More and more molecules of this just come into the cell. So it becomes a great way to image, because you get this amplification in those cells that trap the FDG. So I picture Lou Sokoloff, who is a famous NIHer, who really did some of the fundamental work on deoxyglucose. He, he is not, you can't credit him with the pet agent, per se. But he had the fundamental work here in the 1950s and early 1960s that laid the groundwork for this agent. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's remarkable contribution to imaging. So this is the way a PET scan using FDG looks. It's a lot of brain activity. Um, there's a lot of heart muscle activity normally because of uh, the heart muscle uptake of glucose. There's a lot of liver activity, and it's excreted by the kidneys and into the bladder. Uh, and the rest of the body is relatively quiet, except if there's a tumor, in which case it will uh, accumulate. So here's an example of a patient with a, a breast cancer that's metastatic to the bone. And you can see this uptake here, but also in the sinuses and in the pelvis. Um, and this is also another example of a hybrid scanner because we've now put, in addition to the PET scanner ring, a CT scanner ring. So the patient gets both of these together, and they're co-localized. So now you can look at this hot spot and see it on the CT as this lytic bone lesion or this problem here in the sinus or here in the pelvis. So it's a very powerful technique, um, which is in widespread use now. Here's just another example of another breast cancer uh, patient with a mediastinal mass and a hilar uh, adenopathy or mediastinal adenopathy, some bone lesions, all of which are very well depicted as superimposed on the CT that's acquired at the same time as the PET. So PET uh, scanning has some obvious advantages and uh, a few disadvantages. It, as I mentioned, it's really highly sensitive. Um, in the nanomolar and picomolar range. And that gets you to the point where you can begin to see receptors. So receptor-based imaging becomes possible in vivo, in humans, with PET. It can provide metabolic information. So FDG is just one example, but you can tag glutamine or a fatty acid and see the uptake and the dependence of the tumor on those kinds of uh, uh, molecules. Compared to SPECT, which is its um, progenitor, uh, it has m about uh, 10 times better uh, spatial resolution. And it can be combined with CT. So you get the advantages of the anatomy seen on PET with the anatomy uh, seen on CT. On the other side, it is an expensive modality. It's uh, a PET CT can be 2 or $3 million. Um, it's subject to a lot of regulatory um, demands. and the agents that we deal with have a relatively short half-life, typically of an hour or two hours. And that means that you can't keep them on the shelf. You have to make them and use them all in the same day, which creates a lot of complications. So in our case, we get the FDG, FDG from a production facility in Greenbelt, Maryland. 
they have to leave very, very early in the morning to beat all the traffic. They deliver it to building 21. It gets checked in. It, it moves over to the nuclear medicine department or the molecular imaging program. And, but we can't dally. We can't leave it in a corner and wait because it'll disappear. There won't be anything left. And in fact, each dose that we get from this facility is timed uh, for a particular patient at a particular time. So it's not appropriate to give it early because you'll give the patient too much radioactivity in that case. You have to give it at the time you're supposed to give it. So there, it, you can see that its complexity is a little bit more than say a CT scan or an MRI. So I list here some of the agents that uh, we and others have been working on. Um, sodium fluoride is a super sensitive bone imaging agent. Fluorothymidine looks at cellular uh, proliferation. It's basically an an analog of thymidine. Fluoroestradiol is an agent that can measure the uh, estrogen receptor in vivo. Fluorocholine looks at membrane turnover. Fluoromyzo is a, a way of uh, measuring hypoxia. Uh, there's a, a amyloid agent for Alzheimer's disease. And then you can label antibodies like Herceptin um, or label cells using zirconium uh, oxine and then track them in the body once you readminister them. So it, it has these, uh, it's huge flexibility, uh, but uh, it also has its complexity. So we've covered a lot of ground and I just wanna summarize where we've been in terms of cancer imaging. I hope you've um, gotten some understanding of the, the different ways that each of this te these techniques create images and what their strengths and limitations are. So let's go through it. In terms of resolution, if you're looking for very small things, the, typically the, the order is CT has the best resolution, MRI, ultrasound, PET, and SPEC. Unfortunately, PET has a resolution of about two to three millimeters, whereas CT can be uh, 0.2 to 0.3 uh, millimeters. As we look at sensitivity of the techniques, the order is really reversed. So PET is by far the most sensitive of these techniques, and CT is the least. You need, as we mentioned, grams of iodine to see it on CT whereas you, you need just micrograms of material to see it on a PET. So that's, um, that's six orders of magnitude difference in terms of sensitivity between PET and CT. And these other techniques fall somewhere in between. And uh, then we have cost. If we're just looking at it from a cost perspective, ultrasound is by far the, the cheapest and easiest um, um, modality there is. But CT is not far behind. It's, uh, commercial CTs can, have been steadily falling in price. Whereas that agent PET, uh, the scanner is very expensive as we mentioned, but also the agents that we use to image with can be one to two thousand dollars a dose. So um, that adds up to an extremely expensive and uh, time-consuming uh, technique. So in general, we use CT as a workhorse. It's certainly the most busy part of a radiology department. For specialties, we look at, we use MRI. Um, for problem solving, ultrasound. And then for specific methodologies like bone metastases or metabolic activity, we switch over to PET. And with that, uh, this is my email address and our website. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Um, do we have uh, time for a question? Yes, sir. Sure. So, um, so the regulatory uh, issues have to do with the management of radioactivity. So first of all, there's, there are issues around safety of how secure the radioactive material is because we, we don't want it to get into the hands of terrorists. We don't want it to be spilled inadvertently in a hallway. So 
everybody who's involved with the management of uh, or the handling of a radioactive material has to be certified, recertified, checked, audited, et cetera. Also, it's, uh, you, you know, the, there's potential for disaster in terms of uh, not getting the right dose so the, to the patient. So, uh, you know, an overdose, that would be uh, something that has to be super highly regulated. Um, so that's inside this building, but outside this building, um, outside this campus, uh, we, we think about having to produce these materials uh, with a cyclotron that has to be carefully calibrated and audited and all those things. And then the material has to be produced under something called GMP, good manufacturing practice methods, meaning extremely clean, no bacteria, no uh, contaminants. And that whole process is confounded by the fact that everything's in a radioactive environment. So you can't just go in and take swabs or whatever. You have to, uh, you know, be checked out. You have to have radiation dosimetries. And so really every step of the way, um, from a, a, an investigator's point of view, I have to, and I'm not complaining about this. I, I think it's an important thing. We have not only the, the regular approvals, but also the radiation safety branch approvals that we need to go through. And explanation to the patient of, uh, you know, what the uh, possible problems or side effects of uh, the radioactivity might be. So all the way around, it's very highly regulated environment, as it should be. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so the question is whether you should go for resolution or sensitivity. And that's, that's a great, they're trade-offs, basically. In some cases, uh, for instance, if you want to detect or you're worried about very, very small lung metastases in a patient. That's resolution, for sure. You know, you, um, and um, you really want to see them, you need a very good chest CT. On the other hand, if you're looking for a, a deposit in a bone, um, the x-ray is, at, in, although it has terrific resolution, won't be able to resolve even a small number of cells in the, um, in the bone. But a bone scan, especially a PET bone scan, will readily resolve that. So there you're looking for sensitivity. So it's, there's no easy answer to your question. It's sort of on, on a case-by-case -case basis. But those are the inherent trade-offs that we think about when we're recommending what the next best test is. Thank you. Anton, he got his PhD from the University of Southern California. Then he was a fellow at the Scripps Institute in California. <clears throat> and he worked at a company called Caliper Life Science. And then he came to NIH. And he's currently the uh, scientific director, Division of Preclinical Innovation at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. His title today, Process Improvements to Drive Small Molecule Translation. Anton. All right. Thank you, Terry. Um, it's great to be here again. Um, this is my, what, fifth year um, telling people about translation and small molecule advancements. Um, and every year there's a bit of a different um, story. So um, this year will be different as well. So. What we're engaged with is um, traversing this path between a basic discovery as um, announced in journals like Science Nature and coming up with an actual treatment that benefits patients. So in between, there are multiple steps, and this is actually a pretty naive view of the um, process um, highlighted for small molecules. and. You can imagine there is similar path for, say, medical device or, or biologics, therapeutic antibodies, and so on. Um, first, you need to figure out what you're intervening on. What is this molecular mechanism of yours that you want to target in order to uh, um, treat the disease one way or another? 
then create a test system to begin to evaluate candidate therapeutics, and then, um, in the case of small molecules, conduct um, screening of large number of candidates to find um, potential um, new starting points for drug development. And then there is a um, step of um, medicinal chemistry, where the molecule has to be um, modified in multiple ways, sometimes over the course of um, a decade, making thousands of analogs to the initial um, candidate to improve properties, improve, um, um, say, solubility, bioavailability, and so on. And then the candidate is tested in uh, um, animals, usually, to show efficacy in a disease model. And only later on, um, it is progressed to um, actually testing in, in, in humans. So this process in between is fairly non-glorious. Many times you don't publish many papers, especially in the late stage development. But if you couple it with failure rate at every step, it accounts for the fact that you have a lot of science papers out here, a lot of great stories, especially with the sequencing of human genome, great advances in um, biomedical sciences, and very little comes out the other end. And you also see um, various estimates as to how much it costs to develop a new drug, and it's somewhere in the order of $2 billion. That, of course, is not the cumulative cost. It's the cumulative cost accounting for failure as well. So each project, assuming it's successful, may cost relatively little, maybe only $50 million. But if you couple that with the failure rate, you end up with this enormous price tag. Um, there is also reports that the productivity in this sector is declining, so more dollars going in, fewer approvals coming out. So uh, clearly, just throwing money at the problem is not enough. Also, you look at this graph where um, there is almost 7,000 diseases. A lot of them are rare genetic disorders, so um, single mutation based or related. And there are only about 500 diseases with known therapy. And for sure, there's going to be more diseases um, described in the literature going forward. Um, there are a lot of undiagnosed diseases at present. At the current pace of drug approvals, um, it'll take about 2,000 years to address all these diseases. So clearly, it's not acceptable. So we're trying to dissect the problems associated with each step of this translational process, translating basic discoveries to um, um, final tangible improvements in human health, and trying to define solutions, test the solutions, and disseminate the improvements in these processes. So what are the different problems if you start to sort of unpack this statement? Um, there are many of them. They're both scientific in nature as well as organizational. Um, just to pick a random example, I'll be talking quite a bit about um, our ability or lack of ability to predict safety and efficacy of a candidate therapy at an early stage. So we're working heavily on trying to improve these test methods. Finding scalable approaches to address so many diseases. Can we come up with platform approaches to address, say, 50 diseases at the same time? Um, this goes on and on. There are problems in the clinical space. For example, um, by some estimates, about half of the clinical trials initiated in this country fail to reach completion for all sorts of organizational reasons, usually lack of enough enrollment, um, complexity of multi-site clinical trial. So this is largely organizational in nature. Um, in a PI, tenure track driven environment, there is very little incentive for team science. And when you go from that science paper to an FDA submission, you require a team effort. You need drug manufacturers, you need toxicologists, you cannot just 
make do with cell biology expertise or medicinal chemistry. So you have to be able to work in a team and the system has to be adjusted to reward team participation. So we work on pretty much all of these problems in various ways, trying to um, provide improvements to this process and, and share best practices. And I'll give you various examples to this effect. So I'm going to start by talking about the first steps in this um, early stage drug discovery, which is the high throughput screening to discover candidate molecules. We're equipped with pretty um, high tech sort of robotic systems with a lot of machinery to do the work um, um, instead of human um, based operation. Um, you can view these robotic arms as technicians, they grab micro titer plates, they move them around, perform various steps of the process. Um, and we've been doing this since 2004, actually, um, about eight miles from here in Rockville. Um, by now, high throughput screening has become a pretty standard process in early drug discovery. But a lot of problems remain in it. And one very obvious problem um, that has persisted in this space is the uh, high throughput screening has been done at single dose. So the drug candidates are diluted into whatever um, assay system at one concentration, usually 10 micromolar, 20 micromolar. Um, what we realized, which is actually pretty obvious, is the, the dose is important. And can we improve the process of screening um, to include multiple doses of these drug candidates to, in essence, derive dose response curves from the process of screening. So we actually worked on this for quite a bit of time and developed technologies to prepare the compound library. Um, these various dots of varying intensity are the same small molecule diluted at different levels. So from most concentrated to most dilute. Um, we develop informatics processes to analyze this data to basically crunch half a million dose responses in 15, 20 minutes with minimal um, human intervention. You cannot do this in um, GraphPad Prism or Excel. Um, and couple this with high degree of miniaturization. We use 1536 well plates, so basically 32 by 48 um, array of samples, and really low volumes, um, two to eight microliters per test. And basically at the end, we get these curves or flat responses. We can um, characterize them based on IC50, EC50, so potency, as well as maximum range of response or efficacy delineating um, shallow curves, full curves, um, partial responses, and so on. The net effect is to dramatically reduce um, false positives and increase reliability. We can rank compounds based on potency, do uh, um, clustering based on structural similarity and all that. So we've been practicing this for over a decade and um, have delivered several hundred million data points in the public domain on various screens. Um, this actually has served us very well internally in improving the process of screening, but it has also allowed um, others to build predictive models based on all that data, um, whether it's enzymatic assay or, or, or cell-based assay and so on. We published this back in, in the day in PNAS, but also um, work through examples to, to really try to convince people why, why this process is better. So here is an example of um, sort of graphical illustration of how a false positive due to um, say equipment malfunction or dust in your, in your, um, in your micro titer uh, well um, is picked up by this process. So a true positive shown here from lower concentration to higher. So this happens to be um, activation of signal through luminescence detection um, measured by 
essentially a CD imager or digital camera in very high throughput manner. Left side is actually um, positive negative controls. Um, for true positive, you actually see the development of signals. So every well within some noise cooperates to allow you to, in, in the end, build this curve. Whereas with a false positive, the signal is flat. There is no activity except for the spurious single well signal. So if the screen were to be run at single concentration, you would have picked this as a hit, repurchased that sample, retested it only to show that it's false positive. In this case, it's automatically flagged this negative or lack of activity in this um, system because the software knows that this is a single point um, outlier. So to prepare the library for um, testing, it took a lot of uh, planning and I'm not gonna go through the scheme in, in big detail, but um, you can actually start with traditionally delivered 96 well plate stocks, compress them into 384 well plates, perform serial dilutions, and then compress them one more time into 1536 well plates. So in the end, one 1536 well plate contains the equivalent of 12 uh, or 16 96 well plates. Um, there is also the accompanying process of registration of compounds in the database along with the individual concentrations. We're diluting the library plate to plate, not the way you would do it in the lab manually within the plate by serial dilution because this allows us flexibility to um, skip plates if the assay is very expensive, um, building the curve with fewer points in case there's very limiting reagent like primary cells or, or very expensive um, conjugated um, antibody. So all of this was published allowing others to actually reproduce the process. So I'll repeat this over and over again. Um, we actually deliver source code, everything to the community so that others can actually um, go into their facility and um, reproduce that process. So um, in this space, chemistry is actually crucial. It's not all about robotics and, 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 and building um, cool discovery systems, but also having integrated chemistry pipeline. So this is an example of uh, um, primary screening hit, which is almost 10 micromolar in potency, improved about 100 fold through iterative uh, um, analog synthesis and testing. Along with the 100 fold improvement in potency, um, other properties like solubility, metabolic stability are also being worked on in an integrated fashion because if your compound is potent but highly unstable in, in blood, for example, it'll do nothing um, in, in an in vivo testing. It'll simply degrade within minutes, so you have to account for metabolic stability. Um, and I'll talk more about it in, in, in a moment. Um, this, this actually happens to be the um, first potent inhibitor of um, ubiquitin-specific protease 1, USP1. Um, We've worked on over 200 such projects and, and have delivered um, these high quality small molecule tools um, to study novel therapeutic concepts, whether it's just recently characterized gene and its protein product or new pathway. All of this is available in the public domain for people to study novel aspects of biology. And again, I'll give you more examples in a moment. And then some of these are actually being further developed as drugs. So not every pharmacological tool is a drug for all sorts of reasons, um, but the tools are actually pretty important in order to study new therapeutic um, hypotheses. So something we worked on a few years back when um, the Warburg effect was just sort of coming online and becoming more and more important, um, pyruvate kinase M2, PKM2, um, has been implicated in, in, in um, the Warburg effect. So we worked with um, um, Luke Antley, Matt van der Heiden, and, and, and colleagues to actually run high-throughput screen of um, 
purify uh, human PKM2 to find activators um, of the enzyme. So the assay had to be carefully calibrated, not just to report on inhibitors, but also on activators. Um, medicinal chemistry was done on the candidate molecules, and um, we actually derived several distinct uh, small molecules that activated this enzyme. All of this was published, and um, these two molecules have been distributed to probably over 50 different labs worldwide to study um, essentially cancer metabolism, and, and this is just one small example of early work um, with, with the collaborators um, on unraveling this biology. Another example is this interesting, um, really underappreciated cancer target, human um, pyridoxin reductase, um, responsible in controlling redox balance in actively dividing uh, um, cancer cells where obviously reactive oxygen species clearance is, is, is important. So we actually discovered um, an inhibitor straight from, from an automated screen with minimal chemistry work um, that was actually acting by covalent inactivation of the enzyme. Um, and those of you who are familiar with medicinal chemistry will immediately recognize that this is not a good news. People normally look for reversible non-covalent inhibitors because um, covalent inhibitors are considered dirty compounds. They're believed to act on multiple targets in the human cell and therefore not um, worthy of pursuit for drug development. In this case, this molecule actually turned out to be highly selective. It was not reacting against any similar targets. Glutathione reductase is a similar enzyme in this um, ROS clearance pathway, but you don't want to hit glutathione reductase along with tyrodoxin reductase because it's actually active in every human cell. So molecule that is dual acting would be extremely toxic. So it would be a non-starter. So our inhibitor ended up being extremely selective and why is that? This enzyme, tyrodoxin reductase, has unique selenocysteine residue in the active site, which essentially is responsible for this reactivity. So this covalent action of the small molecule turns out to be extremely context-dependent, binding pocket-dependent. So the drug candidate itself is not reactive in normal conditions, but it reacts with the selenocysteine in the active site of just this enzyme. Um, so this is some in vivo data um, on, on vehicle tumors grow, um, imaged by um, um, FDG uptake, and then in the treated group, they, they shrink almost invariably. Um, and that was done in actually several different models. So current status of this molecule is it's actually progressing. So first of all, it's nice tool molecule for um, redox cancer biology, but it's also progressing um, um, out of Karolinska Institute in, in, in Sweden, um, where they actually spun out a company to further develop this molecule. Um, so really interesting development here. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about another problem that I um, sort of mentioned earlier. Um, we still have very poor ability to predict ultimate effect in vivo. A lot of these discovery screens, assays, they utilize 2D cultured cells, easy to grow cells, micro titer plates, and so on. In the end, your drug candidate goes into an animal, goes into a human, experiences the entire physiology, which is three-dimensional. So how do you actually improve the predictivity of all, all these early testing methods before you spend a lot of money on clinical trials or, or even animal experiments? So we're working on this, trying to build essentially a continuum um, of test, test methods to bridge the super simple high-throughput two-dimensional culture models, and then animal and human are out here, not shown, 
by developing all these intermediate techniques. Um, and I'm going to focus mostly on um, bioprinted tissues, but there's many other things in the space. Um, spontaneously forming tumor spheroids, a lot of you know about them. Um, they're, they're actively being worked on. Um, organ on a chip is actually a series of microfluidic systems or cartridges for, um, through various methods of bioengineering, people are able to build liver on a chip, lung on a chip, gut on a chip, um, kidney on a chip, and begin to connect them to recapitulate human physiology. Um, as you increase the complexity and potentially predictivity of this, um, uh, these systems, you um, lose your ability to test many molecules. So there is a trade-off. So what we're um, working on right now is actually um, um, 3D tissue bioprinting, where um, you can think of this as utilizing a 3D printer, um, essentially a machine that combines several syringes um, along with precise XYZ control. And your cells of interest, multiple cell types, whatever is needed to build a tissue, um, are suspended in this hydrogel. Um, there are various recipes for these. Um, they're constantly evolving. Um, loaded in syringes, and then the printer essentially bioprints or 3D prints these um, mixtures in, 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 in various geometric um, shapes, layer by layer, controlled by um, CAD software. And then after some incubation period, the cells have the ability to reorganize slightly, mature, um, develop contacts. The hydrogel, um, depending on the material, hydrolyzes. Uh, um, and then you have um, eventually the tissue. So we're working on um, several tissues initially through various collaborations with tissue experts, blood vessel wall, retina, um, actually with um, NEI investigator, and skin. Um, the goal is first to learn how to make these tissues through bioprinting, and then create arrays of these tissues. For example, um, a patch of 20 pieces of skin, for example, and then test drug candidates in models of disease or, or um, for toxic effects. So um, the skin is actually our most advanced um, system. Um, and this is really just kind of a quick example what you see in the internet from essentially anatomy um, books or web pages and what we actually can make in the lab um, right now. Pretty good resemblance. We're working on um, um, tissue innervation, vascularization right now, and um, also essentially beginning to add immune system components to this, to this model um, to uh, um, build models for, say, psoriasis or, or melanoma. Yes? Right. So, so it really depends on the tissue, and we're still working out the um, details. Um, what happens is there is a delay, and a lot of technology development has to go into measuring what's happening there, because you can no longer just throw this under a microscope and magically see in depth. Um, staining methods have to be developed. Um, different optical techniques for imaging, um, built-in biosensors, um, as well as secreted um, um, factors, whatever you want to measure. Eventually, you want to keep these alive for a while because you want to be able to do chronic dosing um, so we can keep them alive for, for a few weeks. Um, it's not very easy, though. Um, in terms of imaging, um, Actually, the team has just recently published um, tissue clearing protocol to enable removal of um, lipid droplets and other um, things that essentially prevent you from imaging too deep into these tissues because they're essentially few millimeters thick at this point. 
Um, so there's a lot of technology development that um, has to take place in order to um, really get the right signal um, out of these. And so the type of signal you get will also depend on what exact disease model you want to layer on top of that wild type tissue. So maybe melanoma will have, you know, constitutive GFP expression in, in the cancer cells. Maybe psoriasis will have something that is secreted and, and measured through um, taking a non-destructive sample. We're also working with uh, um, various engineering companies to develop high-throughput um, bioprinted tissue slicing techniques, um, basically to return to sort of good old um, microscope slide preparation, but again in high throughput because the goal is to run eventually drug repurposing screens. So you'll need to be able to print essentially um, maybe 1,000 such patches um, or even more. Um, as an aside, there are about 3,000 approved drugs worldwide. So uh, you, you, you better be able to test at least 3,000 samples, maybe in dose response in um, duplicate or triplicate. So you're talking easily 10,000 sample type screen um, with these. So that's, that's our ultimate goal. We're not there yet. Um, how do you fill these bioprinters with cells? Really interesting question. Right now, um, it's really a jungle out there. You have to buy them from various providers, buy the so-called primary cells. They're usually pooled in terms of sourcing. Um, quality varies dramatically. Costs are very high. So we're working on actually improving stem cell technologies to derive these cells for bioprinting, for um, 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 building these 3D models to induce pluripotent stem cells. Those protocols are still highly variable. They're not scalable very easily. They're very expensive. So what we're doing is we're combining uh, latest in automation to achieve essentially hands-free automated cell growth um, almost like in a um, bioreactor where this machine can split cells, can detach cells, add media, all in sterile environment. So this is example with uh, um, um, hepatocytes actually. We're also working on improving these protocols and um, one example here is um, culturing IPS cells is associated with a lot of stress. The cells grow but the current media components put them on overdrive. And what happens is, um, and I'll play this video in a second, they grow so rapidly and compete for nutrients or, or, or secrete something that we don't know about that they start killing each other. There is a lot of cell death and clonal takeover. And then in the end, several days or weeks later, you have more cells, you have expanded your um, culture but at the expense of a lot of dead cells. So imagine for potential regenerative medicine applications, not only is your protocol expensive, but it in introduces clonal drift. Um, you wouldn't want to put that into a patient. Um, so we've actually um, leveraged their small molecule capabilities to run screens, including screens for combination of small molecules to essentially come up with a four reagent combo that allows for um, essentially, quote unquote, harmonious stress-free growth of IPS cells. Um, helps a lot with culturing and, 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 and um, reducing this, this drift. Um, so green is bad, green is stress, that is dead cells, and essentially you're gonna see more green on the left side and um, a lot less green on the right side. Um, so these are all the dying cells and, and eventually um, clonal takeover, whereas um, here there's, there's um, very little of that going on. So we're working on various protocols um, to also improve differentiation and replace expensive protein reagents with small molecules. That's the only way to make enough cells cheaply enough to fill those bioprinters. Um, 
and to also enable regenerative medicine. Um, switching gears, another problem in the space is predicting toxicity of a drug candidate. Predicting it early enough so that you can avoid failure, you know, $100 million later, right? Um, so about 30% of drug failures um, are still attributed to tox. Um, unwanted side effects, flat out toxicity, things that are not picked up on the cell assay level, sometimes not picked up even on animal level. There is another angle to this, which is environmental protection. So um, there are over 80,000 chemicals in commerce worldwide. Um, there are sources of, um, I guess, pesticides, um, precursors to plastics, you name it, over 80,000, and most of them have no toxicological characterization associated with them, yet all of us are exposed to these molecules all the time um, through our daily lives. Um, it would be prohibitively expensive to use traditional rat toxicology. Also, um, everybody's trying to move away from animal testing. So these two factors combined um, prompted us to enter into this partnership about a um, decade ago with the um, Environmental Protection Agency FDA and um, NAHS down in North Carolina to um, essentially see if we can replace the animal with a battery of human relevant cell based tests that can serve as a um, ranking system or flagging system to prioritize compounds for more um, in depth testing. So you can imagine this process as consisting of um, building a collection of diverse chemicals, running actual tests or cell-based assays, generating this high-quality bioactivity data, and then feeding that into predictive models. Um, these models would first model the activity of a new molecule in the cell assay, and hopefully with time they'll be able to prioritize compounds at the in vivo level. So essentially using um, um, really systems biology to address the problem of toxicity. So um, to this end, we built something um, pretty unique collection of about 10,000 chemicals um, nominated by the different partner agencies. Some of them were approved drugs, um, others were failed drugs pesticides, industrial chemis chemicals, and so on. So really diverse. We're trying to address both the environmental problem and the drug development problem um, in the same sort of grand effort. Um, unparalleled, um, pretty extensive quality control of this collection. We're following the um, stability of these chemicals upon storage. This was never done before on the scale of 10,000 diverse chemicals. A lot of problems um, in terms of how to do this QC. Um, with drug candidates, they're well behaved. You can do um, um, LC mass spec methods for um, QC. With some of these industrial chemicals, you have to apply different analytical techniques. So. Um, We've been um, doing this for a while. It, we actually started it from ground zero. We had to build the uh, um, robotics and the whole process for, for running these tests. And by the way, the assays um, all relate to um, various measures of toxicity. For example, um, endoplasmic reticulum stress response, DNA damage response, um, mitochondrial membrane potential, estrogenic activity, all these sort of hallmarks of badness, right? Um, so we've generated almost 100 million data points for this effort. So this is really the largest ever um, systems toxicology data set delivered in the public domain. Every compound was tested at 15 doses in triplicate. So incredible resolution of this um, data set. We've actually 
put all that data in the public domain and use crowdsourcing to ask others to build predictive models. Um, and the result has been actually pretty phenomenal. Some models um, are 80 to 90 percent uh, accurate in predicting new chemical structures activity in, in, in a particular assay. The EPA has already begun to use the estrogen receptor cell-based assay for regulatory purposes. So this is really where rubber meets the road, at least in environmental protection, and, and um, many other organizations have used that data. Um, and that effort um, continues with, of course, introducing the bioprinted models I mentioned earlier into, into this um, testing pipeline. Um, something else we're doing um, um, in this space, which I mentioned earlier, is building these experimental profiles of approved drugs metabolized by cytochrome P450, the different isozymes. You've probably heard these stories. Some drugs are particularly toxic to certain um, segments of the population. If you have a single nucleotide polymorphism that causes um, increase in um, enzymatic activity of, say, um, C2D6. If you're so unlucky, maybe uh, you will be metabolizing drug X into something toxic at a lot higher rate than the average population. So you should not be taking this drug or your dose has to be adjusted. But how do you predict all that? Um, so we're building these public facing databases and inviting the community to basically use machine learning to build predictive models. A lot of this has been happening um, in private sector, but companies do not collaborate in this space because they don't want to share chemical structures. That's essentially their, their basis for the intellectual property. So everybody builds their models in their silos. Nobody shares anything. So we're trying to break this organizational problem in translation by seeding um, the space with enough public data to allow others to begin to essentially utilize it and add their own data and improve these models. In machine learning, um, there is the concept of continuous learning. You don't just start with one training data set and, and you build one model. So we're, we're doing quite a bit of this, um, also partnering with, with um, the pharmaceutical industry to, to test um, how good these predictive models are. Um, I want to switch gears again and talk about the later stage drug development where things are really heading um, towards um, clinical testing, but before that, you have to go to the FDA with the so-called IND or investigational new drug. And that's really the regulatory space where everything has to be done. You have to formulate your drug for final delivery. You have to develop the pill or injectable. You have to um, clear all the hurdles in terms of manufacturing and in ensuring um, reproducibility and high quality of whatever you're making and are going to give to people eventually. All of this is part of the IND package. You have to have enough safety data um, done in good lab practices, GLP environment uh, on animals. And only then FDA will clear you to go into humans for phase one. So this is really very non-glorious work. You rarely publish papers in this space. This is where a lot of projects fail because in academia, people lack the expertise in this product development. Or in companies, sometimes the small company just doesn't have enough investment to get them through that hurdle. So all of these collectively are referred to the valley of death. You have a good asset. You have animal efficacy data, but you don't know how to manufacture the molecule or you don't know how to structure animal tox study to choose the right species. Formulation may be difficult, whatever it is. So we're working in this space uh, through this collaborative model where um, 
being an intramural group, were not providing funding to the outside partner. The outside partner brings the project to us. They may be stuck at various stages. They may only need support with manufacturing or with formulation development and so on. We use our in-house experts in all these fields. We do quite a bit of this work through contracts, but we have the experts in-house with the actual work done through CROs. Um, a lot of interest in this program. Uh, we actually run it as sort of hybrid between extramural peer review and internal um, programmatic decisions. Uh, over the past six, seven years, we've graduated quite a few projects with uh, um, actual FDA regulatory submissions. A lot of these projects have also been offloaded to a third party, um, basically um, being licensed or acquired um, by a larger company. And, and um, this was only made possible raising funding, for example, after we've done some de-risking um, um, in this space. So um, I want to give you one sort of longer example of this journey. Um, it's actually work that is taking place here with Udo Rudloff at NCI right now as her um, clinical partner. An interesting translational problem. How do you um, tackle metastasis? Right? Um, people don't talk about it. Usually you just try to treat the tumor, right? Whatever that means. Um, but it's well known that metastatic spread is, is, is actually what's killing a lot of people. And, and depending on the type of um, um, cancer you're talking about, um, um, prognosis is very poor exactly due to metastasis. Um, so how do you actually um, tackle this problem? There, there are not drugs that specifically suppress metastasis, right? Um, as opposed to just dealing with cell proliferation and, and, and uh, um, other processes. Metastatic transformation is poorly understood, and so how do you handle this problem when you don't really have specific pathways or enzymes to target? Um, so, again, it took a very large team. We were approached initially um, by this um, uh, expert in metastasis, Sui Huang, from Northwestern, um, with a very interesting um, proposal. So, um, this perinucleolar compartment, or PNC, um, is recently characterized, um, recently discovered, I should say. It's incompletely characterized um, formation in, 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 in the nucleus that appears in um, metastatic uh, cancer cells. And there is good correlation with spreading and so on. Um, I don't have time to tell you the whole story. Um, it is a pretty complex body of proteins, RNA, um, where you don't really have a single target. Um, you only know the association and not much else. So the way to tackle this problem was um, we actually designed the phenotypic screen to simply look for molecules that disrupt or break apart the PNC as a, as a cellular feature. Um, while being careful not to select compounds that essentially kill cells. Um, so that was the hypothesis. By finding, first, can you find such molecules? And then if you find them, will they actually have effect on metastasis? Um, disrupting this PNC doesn't mean, at least a priori, that you will actually have an effect on metastasis. So this took several years, actually, a lot of work. Um, so we ran this um, un unbiased phenotypic screen, um, found a class of compounds that disrupted PNC um, with minimal cytotoxic effects. So this is the PNC prevalence curve um, for this optimized molecule, which was eventually named metarestin. You can imagine why. Um, and this is its effect on cell viability. and it takes a lot of effort to figure out the right model of how to tease those apart. But you can see um, 
almost three orders of magnitude of separation in the two effects. Um, Udo Rudloff actually um, did a lot of this work in his lab, um, developing specific models for metastasis slash spreading versus simply tumor growth. Um, so the effect was, was um, pretty strong. This was actually published very um, recently. You can, you can read the whole story. Um, how does this work? We don't know yet. This is the, uh, um, I guess, prime suspect, if you will. Um, we had to develop a biotinylated version of this drug candidate to do pull down um, and, and find potential um, protein targets in the cell. Um, so metarestin binds to this um, elongation factor um, 1A, um, stabilizes it thermally, so engages it in the cell. We, we, we could do uh, um, what's called cellular thermal shift experiment. Um, to prove target engagement and um, how exactly this engagement leads to disassembly of perinucleolar compartment remains to be elucidated, but um, really it seems to be interfering with, with initiation of protein translation um, that is um, one of the required steps for um, developing into um, essentially um, metastatic phenotype. So where is this project right now? Um, it's actually undergoing this preclinical development. We're really at the um, IND point where we have to develop um, GMP manufacturing process um, and actually move towards toxicity studies in animals. Um, the group at NCATS just finished the um, formulation development for this molecule and um, we're hoping the IND will be filed um, around mid-year in 2019, and um, we actually have commitment from um, um, the NCI leadership to progress this to um, actual clinical um, trial within the NCI. Um, so really the take-home message here is um, sometimes you think you're stuck and you don't know how to approach a problem, and, and, and um, actually approaching it in a very naive fashion, looking for this gross phenotype, you still have that feature, or did you break it up? Did it disappear? Um, may actually lead something um, of, of, of consequence that, that is um, later on developable into, into an actual um, drug candidate. So if, if you don't have a specific cellular um, target like an enzyme or, or specific pathway, you, you, you can still go ahead and consider uh, um, embarking on this um, discovery journey. So um, switching gears again, just quick word on this, which is uh, one way we're spreading the word, one way we're disseminating best practices in this space of early discovery um, we actually worked with um, Eli Lilly, major pharma company, to take their internal um, manual on drug discovery and make it public. Took a lot of um, negotiations with their legal team about 10 years ago, and, and with time, we've actually built a pretty robust editorial team and um, have expanded this and turned it into um, essentially a um, electronic book on the NCBI bookshelf, so we can constantly refresh content, add new chapters um, with great um, statistics of um, retrieval of the ebook um, on the web. Uh, we're trying to socialize the assay guidance manual. Um, Again, adding new chapters on, say, stem cells, um, GMP, regulatory affairs. Um, very recently, we actually um, started investing in video, essentially recording a lot of these um, chapters and lectures. And um, we're essentially branching off, in addition to having the electronic uh, um, book, which you can read um, whenever you want, to actually having lecture uh, um, series, which we call the workshops. So there will be um, three such workshops in, in, in early 2019. They're all in, in the area here. 
um, either in conjunction with conferences or, or uh, um, actually um, on, on campus here. So uh, um, you can actually uh, learn more about it and, and participate. Um, an interesting trend that I don't have time going into detail on is um, we're seeing for these workshops an increase in participation from industry. It used to be the case that people thought, well, industry knows how to develop drugs. They don't need to be taught by academicians. Um, this is changing now. Companies are actually flying people to these um, workshops to learn um, event essentially from this effort, which started um, in academia. This is my last slide. I want to give you sort of a um, really a glimpse into what we're we're embarking on on doing in in the space of automation that is um, somewhat controversial, but it's it's kind of fun to to mention. So these are images from the web, right? So how has biomedical research um, changed in the past? century or so um, in terms of conducting the work. You see a lot of um, scribbled notes, clunky machinery, um, people mouth pipetting, manual work. Um, nowadays you have robotics, you have uh, robotic arms, automatic imaging systems that scan your plate and deliver um, terabytes of data in, in several minutes, supercomputing and so on. Um, what is wrong with this picture? In chemistry, except for protective clothing and safety glasses and maybe um, a couple of microwave reactors, not much has changed. Chemical synthesis is still conducted largely manually in the hood. Um, for sure, people are not mouth pipetting anymore, but um, again, not much has changed. The round bottom flasks, um, spin bars, hot plates, and so on. So you can see where I'm headed with this. We're trying to automate chemical synthesis. Um, we're just starting um, this journey. Others are trying to do this. There are many reports on automation of chemical um, reaction optimization, including in Science Magazine. There are papers um, on the topic almost every other issue. What we're trying to do um, at our place is not so much design new reactions and automate them. There's plenty of talent out there on um, chemical methodology development. What we're trying to do is standardize everything as far as equipment, informatic systems to handle the new type of data and output from these and put all of that in public domain to essentially enable everybody to practice automated synthesis um, for their own purposes. So um, that'll require, again, a lot of parallel developments in um, engineering of how to connect different reaction modules as well as machine learning to improve um, the process of predicting chemical reactions and, 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 and um, reaction optimization. I'll stop here and um, be happy to answer questions. Thank you. So um, check this out. So we're, we're actually combining some lecturing on best practices in early discovery, small molecule screening with the topic of opioid crisis. Um, this will be a two-day workshop slash symposium where we're going to share some of our best practices and, 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 and um, capabilities in small molecule discovery and experts on pain addiction um, and overdose are going to come in and, and talk about latest in this space. Um, we are receiving 
extra funding through the uh, so-called HEAL initiative to, to work on um, building 3D bioprinted models for pain. So a lot of co-culturing of different neuronal types, um, developing IPS differentiation protocols to develop all these different neurons. They're very hard to produce um, and working on novel targets, um, including in collaboration with NIDA and other ICs, actually. So stay tuned. Thank you.